Good evening, welcome back to the live oil painting question and answer session. Tonight I'm gonna to do things a little bit differently. I'm actually uh, using one of the Facebook groups, Learning Oil Painting. I went through earlier tonight, picked out some of your questions that you guys have been posting, and I'd like to go over those and help answer them for you tonight. I uh, just picked out probably about a half dozen or so. Um, so we begin tonight, um, we had a question from Katrina, and she had a question on uh, paint layering and glazing, okay? And so what glazing is, is when you build up very fine layers of paint, very thin, you, you thin it out and you keep building up the color and building it up. So quickly, I just wanted to talk about um, different types of paint. So we have, um, when you look at your pigments and your different paints, the way I have these sorted out is I have my opaque paints on the bottom, uh, I'm sorry, on the top, and then I have my uh, transparents on the bottom. So what that means is that they have a sense of translucency. And when you go in and look on the back of these paint tubes, um, and we can take a look at that, in the fine print, it'll actually tell you, it'll say transparent on this is a, a Davies Gray oil paint from um, Grumbacher. You can see on the back of your paint tubes on some of these different types of companies, it'll list what, how the pigment is. This one is a transparent paint as unlike this one here, this is a cadmium red, that's an opaque paint. So if you're working with layering and you wanna do glazing, you could start by using an opaque base and then use a transparent color over that. You can certainly use all opaque paints or all transparent paints and build it up. Obviously the transparent paint's gonna have that transparency to it so you're gonna be able to see through the paint. It's gonna take a little bit more time to build up your layers to see through it. Whereas the opaque paint is going to be more of that solid uh, color. Um, when I go in um, and we start to do the painting, I don't start with a transparent paint myself. And we actually leads me kind of into my other question here. We had a question from Paul who was asking about um, blocking in color. Uh, we talked uh, in a few videos before about the stages of painting, which was shape, color, and value. and when you go in, when um, you can actually take a look at this painting here that I've started. You can see the process. Uh, this is one that I uh, started a couple nights ago, a couple hours into here. So uh, blocking in, I'm just looking at the shapes of these objects that I'm working with. I kind of try to get the color close, but I'm not worried about it being exact right away. I'm not thinning any of these paints aside from how the brush feels when I'm pulling it across the surface of the, the panel that I'm working on. So I don't sit there and purposefully make it more thin or thick. It's, it's purely a feel of how the brush is going across the surface. That's when I'll dip into my medium, add a little bit more. But when you work with the opaque paints and the transparent paints, um, there's no, I don't really find a difference one way or another. It's really a feel thing as you go. But for blocking in, I'm just specifically looking at um, the, the, trying to get the color close. It doesn't matter if you thin it out. Um, or not. Uh, so if there's any questions other than, uh, you know, if Katrina has any other questions, wants to ask those about layering and glazing and how that process works, we can talk about that a little bit more. Um, I would say just in conclusion that when you are painting, no matter what you're doing, when you paint, you're always glazing to some degree because you're going back over that and you're making adjustments to it. And that's part of the glazing technique. Uh, Adam B asked me a question about do I use different types of uh, canvas or material depending on the subject that I'm painting? And the answer is yes. And I wanted to show you some different types of material. So you guys are all familiar with this. It's just a standard uh, you know, stretch canvas. You can pick this up online or arts and crafts store. Now when you talk about canvas, we can get up close here. Um, there's always what they call the tooth of the canvas, which is that texture. So you're gonna have that, you know, the roughness to it. So when I go and take my paint, I can probably show you real quick. Um, if I grab a color and I pull a line, it's gonna make, you know, that stippled look. You, you see the stippled look there? Um, and sometimes you want that look, that, that's a personal preference, but sometimes you don't want that look. You want the surface to be smooth. So this is a cotton canvas. You could go with more of a, a, a linen canvas. It's still gonna have this type of stippling effect to a degree, but the linen canvas is a tighter weave, so it's not gonna have as much stippling effect to it. Some people really like the, um, 
the, the feedback from the canvas, kind of how it uh, like almost acts like a trampoline and bounces back at you. So some people enjoy that motion um, when they're painting. When I'm, when I'm doing uh, more impressionistic work or, or abstract work, if I want to do that, I probably tend to lean more towards a canvas because it just grabs the, that paint more and I don't really care if it has that stippled effect. If I'm looking for more realism, which is what I've been into lately, uh, I want to have a panel. I, I use, uh, uh, we'll go into this here in a second, I use this aluminum panel here. And this is, uh, uh, we t uh, talked about this too on some of my other videos. This is um, what they call aluminum composite material. And what it is, is it's a thin piece of aluminum on each side, but in the middle, it has like a plastic in the center. So it's like a sandwich almost, but it's this really thin layer of aluminum uh, around the plastic. And what I like about this, I got a piece of plastic on there. Uh, what I like about this is it's, it's absolutely smooth. So I will use, when I create a cityscape like this, I'm going to use a roller and a squeegee. I don't want it to have that stippling effect to it. I wouldn't be able to pull these lines and, and create this type of an effect on the canvas. You can do it. It's just more difficult. This, uh, what I'll do is what's known as a reductive method of painting on here where I'll go in and I'll apply the paint and then I'll actually remove the paint to try to get the, the color of the panel in the back. This is a, a dry painting, it's been varnished and everything. And then I'll build up on top of that. I couldn't get that effect as well on a textured canvas. So I wanna make sure that I do that on this aluminum panel. I've had some people ask too, um, you know, do you prefer a quarter inch or one eighth of an inch? This is a one eighth panel. I have found absolutely no need to go to a quarter inch. Uh, this this uh, has like no bow to it. It's very strong. Um, and I haven't had any needs like while I'm working on the easel to find something larger. I'm not really, you know, that forcefully uh, attacking the canvas. I would imagine if you were doing uh, something like a, um, uh, you know, doing a mixed uh, medium or something, you wanted to put some type of sculptural component or something onto the panel, you might need to obviously have some more support. So that's one, another uh, item that you can paint on. This is another uh, material. This is what we call um, uh, MDF. You can get this at uh, most hardware stores. Uh, this here is quarter inch. It's just, that's the way they sell it. Um, you can get this in four by eight sheet uh, and have the guy there cut it for you. This is a two foot by two foot. Um, same type of effect. I'm trying to you know, use the smoothness of the surface to create this effect to create that painting. Again, I couldn't get this with a canvas. So MDF is really nice too, and as well as the aluminum composite panel, because you can have this cut to any size that you want. So if you had a wall, let's say, and you're looking for a specific uh, panel to fit that wall, it might be 13 and 5 eighths inches by 27 and a quarter inch, you can cut this panel to be that size. I mean, you could do that with stretching your own canvas, but it's kind of a pain to get that exact measurement because you just run this through a table saw and cut it. Another thing too, what's nice about panel is let's say after I completed this, I want to edit it. And let's say I just want to remove the top of this. I said, I don't really want this. I think it'll look better if I crop this out. I could run this through a fine tooth table saw and take that top right off and give the, give the work a new look. That's going to be very difficult on a stretched canvas. So uh, that's the different types of panels and material that I use. Um, over the years, people have used all kinds of things. Uh, you can use wood, uh, the, not the MDF, but like a real uh, panel, like a birch panel. Uh, if you're gonna use any type of organic material like that, I would highly recommend sealing it with a product called GAC 100, which is a, a thin liquid glue. And what that's gonna do is gonna prevent moisture from getting into the wood over the years and causing warp and rot and also keep uh, bugs and uh, things from getting you know into the wood grain over three five hundred years that's a real problem that conservators have with some of those old panels uh, some of the old masters also painted on um, you know uh, brass and copper and those are other types of material that you can use as well really the sky's the limit uh, for the uh, going back to the aluminum composite panel i do not uh, prep it other than to take some uh, isopropyl alcohol wipe that down. Uh, sometimes I'll just use an acrylic layer on the background to tint or tone that canvas, maybe a little bit of gesso. On the MDF, you're going to want to use uh, some gesso. Let that dry, sand it down with some 600 grit sandpaper to make it absolutely smooth for you. So I hope that answers Adam's questions. 
Um, we got a question from uh, Kyle S. He was asking about uh, on the panels different types of cradling. Do I, uh, as you can see here with the MDF and those types of panels, there is, there is no cradling to this. I haven't found a need um, on the quarter inch to, to use that. Again, uh, if you're using a thinner piece of wood, you might get some of that flex more on the wood panel than you would on the uh, aluminum composite. Uh, I've worked with panels that do have cradling. Uh, I like uh, a company called Ampersand. They make some, a really nice uh, panel that has its pre-finished for you. So it has that uh, almost a gallery wrap look to it where it could fit into like a two inch cradle. Um, if you're doing a larger work, I would definitely recommend you know doing some type of a support in the back. Uh, I have a couple panels that are say four foot by four foot or larger. I usually do put a support in the back and you can do an outside you know, mitered edge, put that together for the outside frame, or you can just get some strapping at like a hardware store and use that to support the back when it gets framed up. Um, and then the nice thing with the panel too is you can just use like, uh, the framing becomes a lot more easy to get than uh, if you had a cradled canvas already, you'd have to get something like a floater frame or some type of built out frame was there just, it seems like there's a lot more easy framing options with panel. Uh, so cradling, um, again, if it's really, really large, I would recommend putting some type of support back there. But if you're working, you know, this is a two foot, two foot, I don't find any need to use it um, on this, this size uh, for that or on the aluminum composite panel. And I've worked on the panel up to four foot and I haven't found any need for it there yet either. All right, uh, so Carlos had a question about using acrylic paint over oil paint and you definitely do not want to use acrylic paint over oil paint the oil the substrate of the oil it's going to be constantly in, in motion that and to a degree it's kind of funny to think but like the oil really never permanently dries and if you do put acrylic over oil over time you're going to get flexing and cracking of the paint and it's going to create some uh, odd look um, i don't know if you ever uh you know painting a house and you get some of those old uh, paint from back in the day they used to use oil paint on woodwork and trim in your home and if you go to just put without priming it or sanding it or anything you put try to put a, a modern acrylic paint over that you get a lot of fish eyeing and it just doesn't stick to it because of that oil in the paint so unless you're looking for that effect and you're looking for that look and you don't care if it cracks or fish eyes highly recommend do not put acrylic over oil that will not work at all um, so one of the big topics I wanted to spend some time on tonight and show you a little bit on this demo uh, that people have been asking about is mediums. I see daily there's a post on there, people using baby oil, coconut oil, uh, motor oil, I don't know, but I mean, it's like they, they use almost anything that they can find. And uh, you know, I, I've asked a few people, I said, hey, why do you, uh, you know, not just use standard artist medium oil? And, and a lot of these times these people are in countries right now that can't get supplies uh, because of the shipping restrictions that we're dealing with on a lot of things. So I wanted to spend some time tonight just real quickly show you how I make my medium and all I'm using is um, just standard thinner and stand oil. So I'm going to show you how I mix that um, over here. So this is just a, a mason jar. I think, you know, just whatever you get it from uh, leftover jam. And I'll start, this is just regular uh, odorless mineral spirits. Again, got this at a hardware store and um, nothing special, you get this in the paint department. All right, so I'll probably fill this about a third of the way. Make sure you put your cap on this stuff too because it'll dry, it'll actually evaporate over time. So if you left the cap off, it's not only dangerous because it's flammable, but um, it will evaporate and you'll lose your product over time. So then I just take some stand oil. This is made by a company called uh, Gamblin. You can get this on uh, uh, several distributors online, uh, you know, the more popular artist websites. So that's a gambling stand oil. And you can look at and see inside, it's very much like, um, almost like a molasses consistency. It's very gooey and very, very thick as it runs around and stuff. So I'm going to just put this into this. Let me open up my top a little bit here. I've been mixing this so much over the years, I just kind of eyeball it. So let that run in there. I'm 
All right, that's about right. You just kind of want to be able to see it coat the bottom. I would say maybe an eighth of an inch, you know, based on this depth of this material. And then I'll just take a brush handle and we'll just mix it up. And that's really all there is to it. Now, this will get better actually in a day or two. You can let that sit. You can start working with it right away. That's okay. But in terms of that thinner going into the stand oil and making it one fluid medium, it'll actually get better over the next day or two. But you could absolutely start using that right now. That's it. And again, you'd want to put a lid on this, uh, cover this up, and uh, keep that from being out because it'll evaporate. And eventually what you'll end up with if you did leave it open is you get like a, just a real gooey kind of gross uh, layer at the bottom. And if it fully dries, you can actually reach in and pick it out. It comes out like a, I guess like a hockey puck, like a rubbery hockey puck or so. Uh, so that's one type of medium. What I use on the cityscapes when I'm using that other reductive method, this is liquid. Uh, liquid has come up a few times. Uh, people have asked you know, about using liquid. Uh, I'll show you this, this here. It's, um, you want to shake it up first because it will separate in its jar over time by itself. And I'll put some out on my, just my uh, pad here. So it kind of almost looks like a, I don't know, a peach jelly or gelatin type of uh, look to it there. The thing with liquid when you're using the liquid is it's going to make your paint dry very quickly too. So it has a drying agent to it. So bear that in mind. So this medium here is going to dry far more slowly than the liquid does here. But the nice thing with the liquid, I'll just throw some paint in here, is you can actually, you can really thin down and change the thickness of your paint the more you add. So you can almost make it almost as if it's a watercolor. You just keep pulling that in there. That was a little bit of paint and it can go a long way. And you would just mix it in. So what I do with this here, when I'm using this for the cityscape, I want that fluid look to it because we're going to be pulling a lot of that off of the canvas to reveal the color, the background of the panel. So I want that fluid. I use a roller uh, to paint with those. So I use like a two inch or three inch ink roller. It's a three inch here. Uh, and sometimes I use a larger one, but uh, I want that to be fluid. I don't want to get that kind of matted, chunky up uh, type of a look onto my roller. I want to keep that at this flowing as smooth as possible. So that's what I use for cityscapes um, and the roller is just to keep things moving along more easily. Uh, but again, you can just use that right into your regular painting with a brush. But like I said, bear in mind, it does make the paint dry more quickly. So if you're trying to do something wet into wet and you're working on a piece over, you know, four, five, six hours, you might find the area that you originally started with earlier in the day has dried out and you might have to go back in and rework that area or, or do a process which is called oiling out if it's totally dry. Just be mindful, make sure it's totally dry. We can talk about oiling out later on. Uh, so that's mediums. Um, someone had a question about, uh, was Mark C had a question about what colors do you use for portrait shadows? Um, so when I've worked with skin tones, um, you know, the sky's the limit with skin tones. They run the full gamut uh, across the color spectrum, believe it or not, and they're also going to be influenced by the light of the room or outside that they're in. I found that through working with a limited palette, you can make absolutely any color that you want. So my limited palette, I've used pyro red, cadmium yellow, ultramarine blue, ivory black, and titanium white. I used to use all these different colors up here on the wall. Sometimes I do have to dip back into them if I need a specific color, but um, I, I would use the, the basic colors to make those skin tones. So uh, the red, yellow, and blue, if you, if you look at all skin tones, they're all gonna be basically primary colors, believe it or not. So going back to the shadow, I would use things like uh, red and blue, make kind of a purple, a bluish color. Sometimes it's a brown, which you make with red, yellow, and blue. And that'll actually make a brown, believe it or not, and you can then lighten it up with some white. I understand we got a question. What difference does it make adding liquid over linseed oil from Savita? Sorry if I butchered that. That's okay. Uh, I haven't found any difference mixing those two personally. Uh, the linseed oil, I really only use that for when I'm oiling out. I do have a linseed oil in my, uh, my set here. Um, 
Definitely want to make sure you use an artist grade linseed oil. You don't want to use you know, something that you get at a hardware store. The only time I dip into the linseed oil is if the painting is dry, like the one that I was showing you here, it was dried out. So I might go in here if I'm working in a specific section with a good clean rag and I'll put some linseed oil and work on that. It's totally fine to use the liquid if you wanted to on top of that. I, I personally just don't. Um, the stand oil that I showed you earlier is a, is a version of linseed oil. They use it, they refine the linseed oil to make that stand oil so it's in there too. But I haven't found any negative effects by, by combining the two. Uh, so yeah, that was um, you know how I work with that particular medium and things. But uh, and a thin walnut oil the same way as cajoli. Uh, walnut oil we used to use that in college, so uh, that you can absolutely use. Uh, what I found too with the walnut oil when I worked with it is that over time it'll get tacky and sticky. So when you go to work on that surface area, instead of having it be a nice you know, smooth pull, uh, you know, when you paint, you know what I'm talking about, when you pull, you kind of get that effect uh, on the paintbrush. When you use the walnut oil, you know, and it's new and it's fresh, you can you know, pull a line. But what I found is sometimes when you're working in the surface, it can actually start to make it kind of drag the brush a little bit and becomes a little bit tacky. But if you're sensitive to, you know, thinners and solvents and those types of chemicals, walnut oil is a great alternative, especially for countries that are having uh, supply issues with getting that type of product. So highly recommend that. Yep. All right. Uh, so going back to portraits real quick, again, uh, you know, the, the shadows, uh, it's going to be about your value. It's going to be about the range between the light value, the highlight, and then also that dark color. But uh, I found with a limited palette, you can make any color possible. Sometimes you might go in there with a little bit of burnt umber or burnt sienna and try to pull that out. You just can't get that brown sometimes that's okay too, but um, it's really about just working with that same base color. You can find the middle value of a color and either work up or work down, you know, work up to the highlight or down to the shadow by starting with that main base central color that the figure object is and then going either direction. That's definitely something you could do. Uh, so uh, that was again from Mark C. Uh, we had a question um, about the, uh, the blocking and we kind of got into that tonight about um, you know starting a painting so this is a good example that shows you again how I start the process I'm working with this um, model from life I found that working from life is a lot better than trying to work from a photograph uh, when you work from a photograph all of the highlights and everything are going to be very blown up and blown out so you're going to find your values are going to be a lot a lot pumped up and brighter too on the painting than if you were to um, just paint from real life and you'll find that the color is a lot darker a lot more dirty in reality than when you see it on the photograph so uh, I just go in here I'm just I eyeball out um, you know I sketch in and touch in doesn't really matter the exact detail I'm just trying to see where these objects lay and then I start just kind of put in their base color and then trying to work dark to light as I build that out uh, that's just how I work I'm measuring you know I'll use my paintbrush and I'll measure out distance uh, between objects, the height of an object, and it's going to look different here than there because the angle of the camera is not going to be where I sit, but uh, when I sit here that's what I see on that there. So that's that's how I start uh, blocking in. Um, I, I'm at a point where I just jump around. I don't really you know sit there and think in my thought process, okay I have to block in. Uh, I have to do that first. It's really just kind of all right, I'm trying to make a color, play around, I jump around and kind of do it that way. Uh, we talked in some other videos too is when you approach a painting um, you really don't want to go from like this corner all the way down to this corner because if you paint that way by the time you get here it's going to be disconnected from this up here so you really want to make sure that you jump around and try to bring everything in in harmony together to try to pull the image together and make that happen so uh, any other questions for tonight all right great well, that about wraps it up for tonight. That's what I have for you guys. I will be back next Friday night. Uh, so look for this video. I'll also put it back up on YouTube. It's going to be edited. My channel is Van Patten Art. So if you have any questions after this video is posted, please comment on this, and I will absolutely answer them for you next week. I thank you guys for watching. I hope you have a great night, and we'll catch you next time. If you have enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for notifications of future videos. If you have a question about art or this video, please be sure to leave a comment. Thanks for watching. Happy painting and God bless.